Okay. So we're very, very excited today to have a fellow vet, Katie Ford, Dr. Katie Ford. She's not only an experienced vet, but she's actually also a coach who helps vets to get over their famous or infamous imposter syndrome. That is a very, very classic, obvious, I don't think I am good at what I do. That goes across a lot of different professions, really. So I'm very, very excited to have Katie over here to speak to us. Thank you, Katie, for hopping on this call with us. Thank you so much for having me. You're absolutely right. I'm not only a vet, but that is my huge passion following my own journey with imposter syndrome is to help other people reframe it, see it a little bit differently and realize that, you know what, we don't have to believe that that little voice that jumps in, like you quite rightly say and says, you can't do this, that you didn't earn that, you asked for help on that. Oh my goodness, stop, you're just not good enough. And as you quite rightly say as well, we see it across so many professions. It's not just the vet world, it's, it's everyone. Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing that, really. Let's take us back a little bit more of how it all first started. Can you just share with us why did you become a vet? Of course I can. I mean, I look back and I think the decision was made very early on, as is the case for, for many, many people. I remember finding drawings I'd done as a six-year-old, you know, with a white coat and the stethoscope and the cat that I was holding. And again, similar to a lot of people that went into the profession, I had a lot of animals around me growing up and my parents very much nurtured that. I was quite a high flyer at school. I enjoyed communicating, I enjoyed science, and I spent most of my teenage years training dogs. So it just seemed the, the natural progression, although I'll be honest, I had a little blip where I wanted to be a doctor for about a year and a half, maybe when I was maybe 15 and a half, 16, just about getting to the point of applying for vet school, not vet school, university. And it's because when I was 16, I, I had an awful incident with my ruptured appendix. I was in hospital for a very long time. And I talked to the doctors and they were all like, why do you want to be a vet when you could just be a doctor? And I was like, uh, I guess maybe, yeah, that could be right. And when I got to college, my chemistry teacher actually said to me, if you wanted to be a vet for all these years, why have you changed your mind? Like, why have you given up on it? And I thought, I don't know, why have I given up on it? And I think I'd always thought, you know what, you can't get enough work experience to apply for vet school in just one summer, forgetting all the dog training experience and everything that I'd had in the background. But I just had this light bulb moment of there's nothing actually to stop me trying. You know, I loved the thought of being a vet for all those years. And then I had a couple of doctors say to me, oh, be a doctor instead when I was in the hospital. And yeah, I went for it in the end. I thought, you know what, I'm going to try. And I had a summer of dairy farms and kennels and I went to like the guide dog training center and anybody that had animals or had connections to farms I was like please can I just come for a week <laughs> and I did it which hopefully might inspire some people out there to think you know what you don't have to have prepped to be in a vet since you were 12 there's this chance to to still do it even even a little later on it is very, very interesting you mentioned the thought of being a doctor but end up as a vet. I'll circle that back. Uh, I'll circle back to that in a bit. But I just want to ask you, uh, so when you went to vet college, may I just ask which vet college you go to? I went to the University of Liverpool and very, I very loved nice. it there. Very, very nice. And what challenges did you feel you faced in vet college? I think one of the main challenges for me was going from high school and college, being the high flyer all the time, to get into vet school and everybody being like that. Everyone was a high flyer. And I joke because, you know, everyone's special, but I went from being like this high flyer to being on paper distinctly average. It's like, oh my goodness, maybe I am a fraud. <laughs> How have I got here? And I also think just in the first few years, a challenge for me was finding that balance between working, having time off. Um, and again, I think that set me up well for actually going into work too. Um, and again, it's, it's just the, the bulk of what you have to learn. Mm. But at the same time, it, it was a, a challenge that I embraced at the time and uh, it, it stretched me and grew me as a person. And when you finish vet college, tell me a little bit more about the first job you had. So I had a pretty interesting first job in the fact that what actually happened when I was in my final year of vet school, 
I applied for the internship at Royal Vet College and I was offered it and a couple of days later I had a proper wobble because I was at the time seeing practice as a student in mixed practice mm. and I thought oh my goodness everybody else is going to be going out there and doing bitch space and doing cat castrates and first puppy consorts and I'll be in this amazing hospital but I'll know loads about I don't know um spinal fluids perhaps but I'll know nothing about the opinion and I, I cancelled it two days later. I said, look, no, thank you very much for the offer. I'm not going to take it. At which point, funnily enough, but it wasn't funny at the time, but I sat next to someone at BSAVA Congress and I started telling him I'd offered this internship, but I never told him that I turned it down. And he went, oh, that's an amazing job. It's the best one you'd ever take. Anyone that turned that down would be an idiot. At which point I'd already turned it down. So I remember driving back up the M6 crying like, you're an idiot. Oh, wow. So... What I ended up doing was once I passed my finals, I made the classic mistake of just take the first job that you see. I was in a bit of a scarcity mindset, you see, of, well, just grab something. And I ended up taking a job partly because the wage sounded good. Again, another thing that we don't want to fall into the trap of. But it was nearest to home. And I went to a very busy first opinion clinic. It was open surgeries. So whoever turned up got seen. Mm-hmm. And that meant that because consultation fees were only £12.50 and boosters were £12.50, we got a lot of people, which had its advantages because, you know, there were a lot of opportunities for animals where vet care might not be a possibility costing wise otherwise that they could come in but at the same time it was a lot of bulk work wise for a new graduate so I went from potentially going to work at the Queen Mother Hospital um, and having a great time at RVC to going to starting consults at nine o'clock in the morning and sometimes consulting constantly until midnight that night it was really hectic but you know what I look back and I was there for nine months and I'd never change any of what happened Mm. all my routine surgeries I got good at those very quickly Mm -hmm. because of yet the numbers of them that I was doing Mm -hmm. I saw a huge number but at the same time I was starting to feel like I want to have longer consults and I want to spend Mm. longer on individual people as well Mm. How did you feel that college prepared you for your first job or for working life in general? That's a tough question. You know, it's been, I've been out for eight years now and I feel like I could probably have been better prepared in the way of realizing that autonomy of me being in charge of cases Mm. because at vet school when you're shadowing clinicians and it's their case and you go and read up all the information behind it and why they've made those choices is very different from when you're in the actual position of right it's your choice to make but Mm. not only are you not in a referral center where there's all these possibilities and gold standard is often the the first choice we've also got money factors added in there we've got individual patient factors we've got client preferences and i remember my first day in work i drove home and just sat on on i think on my parents bed and just stared at the wall like shell shocked of you've done it and it was only a half day they'd very kindly set me up with a half day for my first day i don't know goodness knows what happened when i drove home i probably drove through every traffic light going because i was just like oh, i've done it i've done it i've done it so i think in some ways they probably did set me up well um but in other ways i think that it was a lesson that i needed to learn when i got out there too sure and um i i, I mean i also remember when you're talking about imposter syndrome so let's talk a little bit about imposter syndrome why um were you did you feel the imposter syndrome that's uh can you tell us a little bit more about your experience please as an imposter which i know obviously you're not yeah i i did really really felt it and um, after that really busy first job i actually changed to go to a practice that was almost the polar opposite so i went to 20 minute consultations um a lot of clients that were very compliant wanted to do everything we had visiting specialists we had all um high-end equipment and it was the the complete polar opposite and again i I learned a lot there when i first got into that job i'd already had some twinges of imposter syndrome in my old job Mm -hmm. i started getting that little bit of a niggly voice coming in saying stop asking your boss for things you should know how to do this by now Mm -hmm. so then i started finding other places to get help like 
ring the lab, look in the textbook, go and look up some videos or some CPD. And then every time a success came in, almost that, that little inner narrative would jump in again and say to me, yeah, but you only got that because you asked for some help on that. You know, it's not really your win. The specialist told you what to do. You were just the middleman. And as time went on, I became so terrified of having any mistakes or any failures that I used to try and remedy this by staying in work longer. So externally, when I was in my second job, um, time had gone on and I built up this loyal um, client base and I was getting gifts and presents every day, but I never felt like I earned any of them. I felt like I had so many complaints that were waiting to happen for things that I'd fixated on being a fault, but I'd get a thank you card and not a complaint and I couldn't quite work out why that was the case. But for me, with, with time and this progressed, it became very unsustainable. I, I'd jog past work just so I could go into work and see, have any of my cases come back in? Has one of the other vets had to see it and found something that I missed? And then they'll think that I'm this big fraud and that I didn't actually know what I was doing. And imposter syndrome itself isn't a mental health condition. It's a reaction to a set of stimuli. So that might be an achievement or that might be a progression or that might be you, you being in a certain job role but it can progress with time to anxiety and depression. And that's what happened for me. I felt like on the outside, everything looked great. I was studying for my certificate at this point, which I then subsequently got. Um, I was a senior vet. I used to give client evening presentations. I was on the radio. Um, I had a brand new car and a, a nice house. And, you know, it, it looked like it was sorted, but I felt like the proverbial swan gliding across the lake, you know, my legs were kicking like crazy. And I was like, one day they're going to find out that I don't actually know what's going on. And that for me did progress, like we say, to a lot of anxiety um, and feeling very, very bad towards myself, really, and, and quite a dark place at times too. And that was really something that I started opening up the message and talking about a lot more because I felt like I was the only one that ever felt this way. I felt like my life was this big cover up. I was making this huge armory of qualifications that I could hide behind, you know, if I've got a certificate, I played a lot of it'll be okay when. It'll be okay when you have been a year qualified. It'll be okay when you've been two years qualified. It'll be okay when you've mastered the bitch spay. It'll be okay when you've got your cert AVP. It'll be okay when you're a partner in the practice. It'll be okay when. And I just couldn't understand why I could never let myself be happy. And I thought this was like a fault and was only me. And that's what really led me on to finding a lot of methods that helped me for imposter syndrome. And that, that started um, with CBT, um, cognitive behavior therapy via the doctor, just because my old boss came to me and said, I'm really worried about you. I don't know how to get you to see how brilliant you are. You're the best vet I've ever had and you can never, ever see it. Mm. And I was like, she's just saying that. She's just saying that. She's making that up. You know, <laughs> she can't be true. She's not had that many vets. Maybe she's had like 10. Maybe she just had a bad vat, batch, you know, <laughs> perhaps that makes me the, the best of a bad bunch and all this rubbish that we tell ourselves. But I thought, you know what, if she's worried about me and I haven't actually told her how worried I am about myself, maybe I need to reach out and get some help on this. And that was more of a point of like anxiety and depression type signs, but it started with imposter syndrome. Mm. And as I learned more about CBT and I actually um, learned a lot more like personal development and self-development um, lessons, I realized, you know what, actually there's a lot of things that if I'd known these at the beginning, mm. that would never have happened so badly. Mm. And I started posting on Instagram and just saying to people, you know what, this is how I used to feel. And quite often now I choose not to believe it or I reframe it or I see it in a different way or, you know what, it's okay to, to ask for help. You don't have to know everything yourself. Having a failure doesn't make you a failure. Making a mistake doesn't make you a mistake. You know, we're all going to make some mistakes at some times and it's what we do afterwards that is the important thing. It's not the making of it in the first place. And so many people were coming to me and saying, oh my goodness, I thought it was just me. That story resonated with me so much. And eventually I went on to train in the methods that really helped me. So I did some qualifications in CBT, not to train other people in CBT and do therapy, but just to understand it more. I trained in coaching. I've um, been mentored by a Proctor Gallagher consultant for the last three years. And all of these bits I've just enjoyed then 
sharing with the vet world and my my instagram following grew i think i've got like eleven and a half thousand people on there now i've spoken at various events and it just became a passion you know i did my internal medicine certificate and i thought that's the path that i go down i thought that i'd go and work in a referral center and become a resident and a specialist but when i stepped back and realized how much of a difference knowing these things and knowing that I'm valuable and it doesn't just sit on being a vet and that life isn't just a performance related experience. We're so much more than our, our job title. It's a brilliant part of us, but it's mm. a part of us. Mm. It completely changed my, my trajectory and I've loved it, honestly. So that's, that's been my experience with imposter syndrome so far. Let's circle back to the root of it. Do you know, can you give us any insight on why it happened in the first place and um, does it affect a certain type of people more than others? Absolutely, of course we can. So imposter syndrome was first written about in 1978 by Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes. Mm -hmm. But we know it will have been around before then because it's, it's a feeling, a feeling of being fraudulent. And they at that point saw it in high achieving women, but since then papers have come out to say it equally affects men and women too. And they think that a lot of the roots of it are in our belief systems. So things that we either believe about ourselves, about success or about failures. And I often think of a lot of those belief systems we wouldn't choose almost make up that little negative inner critic. So the belief systems they theorized, Clance and Imes, were that a lot of it can stem from childhood. So if you've had a high achieving sibling that maybe you've been compared to a lot by parents and even if you've got as good as them then they're just like oh they're the smart one and you're not and you're like oh i must have, well i didn't really earn it and and so on so that's one the second sort of model that they theorized was whether it's that people have been labeled as the the high achiever you know the the baby that they say oh you were walking really early and you read before anyone else and you're just naturally brilliant and then we end up having this pressure of, I have to be naturally brilliant at everything mm -hmm. instead of that growth mindset of, you know what, people are good at things because they've worked hard at them. Mm -hmm. Nobody walks out of vet school and is this naturally brilliant vet, although we mm -hmm. quite often have that pressure on ourselves. And I think a lot of that stems back to, yet yeah, the, the grades needed for vet school are higher. So maybe we are attracting the high achievers that have perhaps been mm -hmm. the ones that were the bright ones in the beginning and have perhaps had that pressure equally it's it's like societal stereotypes too what mm -hmm. what is our view that we've been exposed to of maybe what a vet should look like or what someone else's career should look like is it that we all think that a vet should be like james Harriet, and therefore we've kind of got this oh well i'm not very much like that or what's our stereotype of what maybe a, a clinical director in a vet hospital should be like and if we don't match it do we start feeling like a fraud so that's sort of the, the origins of it. There are a lot of different beliefs that can add into it. Again, that comes to like beliefs about success. Do we truly believe because we've always been told that success is just if you do something solo mm -hmm. or is it if you do it with speed and with ease? Uh, failure is failure a bad thing, is failure a fault? School tells us to compare and compete all the time, which again kind of adds into the well, I'm, I've done all right, but I didn't do as well as everybody else. So maybe I am a fraud. And as for the, the second part of the question, the types of people that it affects, the, the studies out there for imposter syndrome are 70% of people in the general population has been the most widely cited figure for it. The others that I find it's up to 85% of people. So whilst yet we think about high achievers, at the same time, it can be anyone. And I've spoken to people that are cake makers that feel like frauds because they don't have any qualifications in cake making yet have made brilliant cakes. I've spoken to people that are airline pilots that have got imposter syndrome. I've spoken to people that are medical doctors, dentists, vets, shop owners. It, it's so wide reaching, but a lot of it does come down to our beliefs of, like we say, mm -hmm. what we think that person should look like when they what that success should look like. And also just realizing that it's so wide ranging and can manifest in quite a few different ways too. Another group also of people I like to add to that would be parents, mothers and fathers. It's like, how do I know what to yeah. do to raise a kid? I haven't got an instruction manual. <laughs> so there is certainly one big area. 
Yeah, and I can imagine that again comes down to that stereotypes, doesn't it? Of we think because we watch other people look like they're doing brilliant at it, but we never see like what's going on internally that we're like, they've got it sorted, they've got it sorted, they know what they're doing. And the reality is they probably don't know either. They're just they probably look at you from the outside they've got it sorted too so uh, a lot of imposter syndrome benefits to helping with it are just talking about it too you know yeah I feel uh, like I'm making it up as I go along I know I'm not and we're never we're not born with an instruction manual like you say uh, like how fast do you change that diaper that was impressive <laughs> um, okay uh, so a little bit more about software. <laughs> yeah. So current affairs, really. Um, so in our vet profession right now, and it's very interesting what you mentioned about imposter syndrome. So right now in our profession, we do have some um, statistics that's a little bit worrying. So in general, when I when I speak to members of public and I hear from counterparts as well who are vets, it's a, once you say that I'm a vet, and uh, invariably many of them, not all, many of them, wow, that's always what I wanted to do. You're so lucky. I wish I was a vet and I didn't feel I was good enough for whatever reasons, but they always say that, okay, being a vet is pretty amazing. Um, in our sort of current uh, profession right now, we know that there's quite a high level of depression, whereas vet life, you know, they mentioned yeah. doubling their phone calls every year for the past few years, which is quite worrying, or people calling for help uh, for mental health and depression, or just for someone to talk about. Yeah. And also, we do have quite a high rate of attrition as well, of uh, SPEEVs, uh, sort, of recommend, uh, sort of showed that there was about 38%, more than a third of vets would quit their jobs if they could yeah. afford it. Um, and uh, last but not least, we also have the um, well-documented, unfortunately, uh, high suicide rate, whereby we are twice more likely in our lives compared to the medical profession and four times more likely than the general public. Um, why would, I would like to your thoughts on how did this happen considering that we are a profession that, as I said, many people deem to be quite honorable, held in high, self, uh, high esteem and they want to be vets. But yet, in the vet profession, these things are happening. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on that? I think it certainly is a complex topic. And we know topics like suicide are multifactorial. And quite often, they don't think there's one specific thing. But mm. I find from my own experiences, certainly now that I work as a locum and I go into different clinics, there's so much pressure on a daily basis mm. put onto staff. And that can be pressure from time pressures because there's a lot of extra cases and we're also caring that we want to do the best thing for each patient but sometimes there's the time just isn't there so we end up staying longer and longer and longer hours mm. and I also wonder sometimes because there's almost not I don't know not a clear progression rate in the vet world but I think sometimes people think, is this all there is to this job? Is it just mm. going to be that for the rest of my life, I'm, I'm stressed, I'm worried and can't keep up with the mm. caseload and I'm exhausting myself. And in terms of other sort of contributing factors, obviously we've got things like imposter syndrome adding in, adding to anxiety, which can have those, those knock-on effects as well. People mm. have got lives outside of the vet world that maybe their relationships are strained if they're staying at work longer and longer hours too. We've obviously got the influence and the relationship that we have with clients as well, where there's a lot of emotions. It's an emotion filled job. And we're also as vets and you'll know, we're put through the emotional ringer in terms of the first consult can be a puppy and a really happy family really happy puppies there and then the next one comes in is the elderly lady who's 17 year old sole companion dog you have to put to sleep and then the the one after that you've got someone that's really angry and frustrated because their skin for their dog has flared up again and it's the 10th time and they really want answers now and you're running 10 minutes behind and I think sometimes that can seem frustrating at, as the root of it of like where how can I enjoy this more and one of my reflections certainly from my old journey would be once I'd learned more about imposter syndrome and I enjoyed my job a lot more one of the things that I really liked about it versus um being in the first job that I was in was the longer consults and although I don't think that longer consults are going to fix the the suicide rate in the vet world because yeah it's complex and 
I don't fully know the ins and outs of the reasonings behind it. I've looked at quite a bit of it, but I know, for example, Rosie Allister from VetLife, she's a really good person to, to go from my personal experience, I found that having longer 20 minute consults and a slightly smaller client base, mm -hmm. you could satisfy that service. You had the time to do it as well. Mm -hmm. And you almost had more satisfaction, mm -hmm. job satisfaction, certainly, in terms of just being able to build a rapport and get to know people and treat people as people and they taught you as people as well but it's it's a tricky question isn't it and knowing how to move forward with that i think in my opinion i think something needs to change both for some mistake yes we'd also have um a lunch break and um, longer consults or uh, can we reduce the, the workload similarly so I think it, there's a lot of factors that need to be looked at and also educating the public as to the fact that we're, I know quite often we can be perceived me grabbers or whichever terms that people might label us as terms, but realizing that actually money is a part of it but it's it's part because we're a business at the same time and I've not met a better nurse that doesn't love animals to pieces. And we end up in that, that awful position of knowing just what's the right thing to do for a patient. But the final aspect of it whole to do that. And it, it's not that we're being ordered and we just can't treat them for free because it's, it's the bosses and the, the owners of the clinic and the corporates. We, they're a bit And I think it's kind of educating the public to that at the same time, we know in an emotion fueled situation, people aren't going to think logically and, and rationally. So that's when it comes back to teaching vets and nurses as much about realizing, you know what, we've got to look at how people respond in certain situations and know that it's not a reflection on you as a human being. But here are the things that will increase our and improve our communication skills too. So I think there's a lot of certain areas that need looking at with it. And it's, it's sad because yeah, we're a group of caring people and putting this, this position maybe that that makes for these sad statistics. Uh, Katie, I am uh, very interested that you mentioned that about money actually. So another sort of a misconception and before I go into that, thank you very much for insight. That pretty much mirrors with sort of what, what I'm thinking of really. Um, I think certainly there's a lot of changes that needs to be done to address this multifactorial issue. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned about a uh, money. So another sort of a common fallacy or conception or perception that uh, I mentioned that, that I see is that when I tell people that I'm a vet and um, also quite a lot of them go, wow, well done, yours is so well off. And uh, I tend to, like yourself, roll my eyes, but I think of two different things. I think of number one, why do you think like that? And number two, do I even want to try to convince you it's not really true? And so I wanted to uh, have your perspective when, why, why do you think people say that? And have you had similar experiences yourself? I've definitely had similar experiences myself as well. Yeah, where uh, people think that you'll be rocking up to work in a Bentley or a, a Ferrari, but you're really not. No. I think maybe because people are so used to going and seeing that purchase of an object somewhere and that the person that you give the money to, they think of as then earning or having that. And I think they don't realize that vets and nurses are often salaried and that it's, there's a lot of overheads as well. I don't think people realize like how much cost there is actually associated with not only the, the running of a practice, but the cost of drugs and so on. So I think there's a perception that vet treatment is expensive. And I think a lot of that perception comes from the fact that people aren't aware of how much treatment actually is on the NHS. So in the, in the UK, we're lucky that we've got a funded health service, but people think that an x-ray is free. Mm. Mm. So I think there's that comparison almost. I also think that maybe people think of it up in the, the high, high flying categories of professions alongside like vet, uh, dentists, medics, um, and they think that we're going to be on a par 
wages wise with them too so maybe maybe it does come from that and one of the things that I always find is is quite a nice anecdote just to to tell people when they'll say to me oh I've been to the vets and it's this much and it's so expensive and the vet thinks I need this scan doing and now I just say to them you do know that most vets are salaried and I said you know they won't get they don't get a bonus for how many scans they book in for the week I said they'll get paid the exact same amount as whether they tell you they think your dog needs the scan or whether they don't they're actually telling you that because they genuinely think that that will be the best thing to do not because they're going to get a 50 pound backhander from that or because that's going to be their christmas sorted it's really not and then they're like oh really you're like yeah they they, they get paid the same amount like i used to get paid the same amount whether i stayed three hours late at work or not i was just doing it because yeah i was trying to uh, cover up the fact that i thought someone was going to find me out and i wanted to do a, as good a job as i possibly could but i didn't get paid more for that you know, on an hourly rate, I was probably paid less than minimum wage at some points, the amount of time I used to work. Yeah, I, and I, I totally second that. So just to share with you a little bit of my experience in my first year, I actually calculated uh, with all the hours that work, how much was I paid? And it turned out to be something like £3.25 <laughs> per hour with all the on-calls wow. and things like that. Exactly. It doesn't but, surprise uh, me. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is where it would be a good opportunity to circle back to our very, very first, uh, the, the first the interview when you mentioned about potentially being a doctor. So, uh, what would you have considered sort of being a doctor or being a vet uh, in terms of sort of a remuneration? How do you think of the differences of being a doctor and a vet? What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, I, I don't know what I was thinking because I'm a huge wimp when it comes to anything human. So, I really don't think I would have been a doctor. <laughs> Maybe I would have got over it. Who knows? But yeah, if I have anything done to me, I'm on the point of passing out. So, I think in terms of financially wise, I've got friends who are doctors and have risen up through the ranks and I know that they'll potentially be earning at least twice as much, if not three times as much as a vet. If they start going into locum work, then again, yep, they'll be earning two or three times what a vet would. Mm. At the same time, we're all animal lovers and we absolutely adore and value and look after every patient and yep, lives are valuable pet lives are valuable and we know that but at the same time i guess they do have additional pressures of it's human lives too and i think they're all equal in my mind but there are people that value human life more too and there's a lot more um litigation and similar in there i know they've not got the best um mental health record either and have equal stresses as well so I think I probably would have had a very similar journey if we'd put on one side my squeamishness and I'd actually managed to be a, a doctor, I imagine. But remuneration wise, yep, there's more, more money. But at the same time, if you don't have any time to spend that money, then money doesn't bring us happiness. So, uh, True. Um, one thing which I'd like to ask you is, um, so when I had when I was in college, we had lecturers uh, and uh, a female lecturer, and she told me that she was the only female in the class back in the 70s. And uh, right now we are seeing the complete opposite. When I was in my year, there were 150 people, and uh, of which 35 were males and the rest were female. And I remember in my fifth year, looking at the first year, the new cohort that just came in, there were 220 students, of which 19 were boys. So the ratio was seven is to one, and this, this, this at the Roy Vet College. So what's your thoughts on this feminization of the profession? Why are there much more females being vets compared to males? It's a tricky one. And you know, the irony is I was asked this in my Bristol vet school interview eight years ago as well. And I wonder if it's, obviously we've got, a lot of high achievers in um, both male and female. We know that. And whether it's that more men go down the route of medical doctors, I don't know what the stats are in medicine, if it's more, more male applicants than female. I'd be really interested to see that, actually. Mm. And whether it's perceived that we're more, as females maybe were more nurturing, potentially. It's, it's something I've always always thought on and um, maybe years back then it was more like the James Herrier era and it was seen again as this stereotype of a very male profession um, mm. or maybe it was just a less 
females in general going into into university and into academia in general but now the the rise in the number of women that are doing it I'm, I'm not quite sure I think on this quite a lot and I imagine it might be that perhaps you've got high achievers and we get to that point and we're we're funneled almost into right so you go to university now right you like science um what are the routes that you can go down now either it's a straight science degree or actually maybe you'd be good in a medical profession right we've got vets we've got dentists we've got doctors which one are we going to channel you into mm. i don't know maybe it's back at that point of um of school or maybe as more students aren't sure what they want to do and they go and do work experience perhaps as there's more females in the profession um more students start seeing that inspiration and going oh i'd like to be a vet as well and they're female too but I don't know, tricky, tricky question. And that's probably a slightly more comprehensive answer than I gave eight years ago. But well, more than eight years ago, it'd be 13 years ago now, actually, because it was pre-vet school. <laughs> well done. Thanks for that. Um, how do you see the future of veterinary medicine? I mean, I've, when I've qualified this, the likes, you know, there wasn't the likes of all these referral centers, all these specialists, all these uh, super vet, so to speak. And uh, so that's you know, less, than, less than 20 years ago. So moving forward 10, 20 years, how do you sort of see the shape of the profession, the type of vet medicine that's being produced or being presented? Hmm. How do I see it or how would I like to see it? How would you like I, to see it? Let's yeah, go with, how let's like go with Howard. It? I'd like to see more smaller practices, but hmm. more bespoke. Oh, um, because I found that certainly when I worked in a practice where there were two vets, we had 20 minute consults, we provided a high level of service. Mm. I, as a vet, loved working there in the end mm. because I knew everybody, I built bonds, they trusted me, that gave me more job satisfaction. Mm. And it also meant that if you had more practices, there'd be a lower caseload for each of them. But at the same time, there might even be a higher spend because of just the fact that you've got time to educate people. I talk about this a lot in terms of when I talk about 20 minute consults, people say, oh, well, you can only get half as many consults in there. And I'm like, no, but you can educate people well. Mm -hmm. If, for example, I've seen it as, as a look and the pressure that people are under, you've got a 10 minute consult and the dog's got a lump on the side. And you say to the client, look, we can never tell what anything is from the outside. We'd usually suggest fine needle aspirate, cytology, mm -hmm. um, but we've only got 10 minutes here. So you're going to have to book in tomorrow and have that done or next week. And it'll be this much money, etc." And they go, oh, well, I think I'll just keep an eye on it instead. And then in the notes, you have to put decline cytology, declined histology, etc." Mm -hmm. But when you've got 20 minutes, you could say to them, look, we can never tell what a lump is from the outside. Um, it could be something completely benign. It could be something more concerning. For your peace of mind, why don't we consider taking a sample from this? I can do it right now for you. All I have to do is just pop a little needle in there, take some cells out. This will go to the lab. They look at it under the microscope. The, the fee behind this would be this much. Most of that is the lab fee for the specialist to look there's a small chance that it might come back inconclusive. And if it does, we need to take more of a biopsy. They usually tolerate this really well. You can stay with him. We can do it now and we can take him home now. Would that work for you? Oh, yes, please. And then they have it done in the consult there and then. And I see people trying to do them in 10 minute consults and sometimes it works, but sometimes you put yourself another 10 minutes behind and then the next one and you have four of those in the day and you're 40 minutes behind, if not longer. So I'd love to see it like that. I think that... With the advent of remote prescribing in the corona um, crisis now, I think that that might end up being involved a little more as well. I wonder if there'll be more over-the-counter potential medications that are developed. Um, I wonder if perhaps there'll be more of a, a focus on some vets working from home more and doing more sort of video consultations, but perhaps from their practice with their clients as follow-ups. Um, I'm not sure that I, I prefer seeing patients in real life and examining them and talking to people, but I do wonder if that's coming. But I really think that the advent of more of the bespoke, maybe even, I don't know, the, the independent side to it, but the smaller practices. For me, I found that working as a vet, that provided a much nicer quality of life of mm -hmm. high quality, less cases, good service. Um, 
and it meant that you actually had less of a caseload too so it would be nice to see it go that way that's what my dream would be because i think there'd be happier vets out there rather than right okay so we've got a solid day of 10 minute consults and we've got an extra four people that are booked in that we just have to create this vortex of time to make time for four more consults but at the same time the vets will stay and they'll work on those mm. because they won't leave that patient mm. but then at the end of the day you're just shell-shocked mm. like i've worked locum shifts like that and i come home and i'm just like mm. <laughs> but when i used to do my my 20 minute consults and have shorter days and perhaps more flexible working hours and and getting that more of a balance between this is the vet part of me and this is the parent part of me and this is the, um, I don't know, running part of me and this is the just sitting and being part of me and we embrace that, then I think we'd probably have a lot less of that attrition and a lot more of people finding that they can make the career work for them rather than just thinking I, I don't fit this mold and I'm going to either jump out and go and do something else or, or leave the profession. I agree, I agree. Um, just to wrap it up, one, one final question. What three tips would you give to a young vet or a vet who is studying to be a vet or not even young vet or even an experienced vet, how to overcome the imposter syndrome? My three top tips. The first one would be talk about it. You know, talk, read other people's stories, realize that if you're worried about something, get it out there, externalize it. The second one for me would definitely be realize that it's okay to make mistakes mm. and to fail mm. and that asking for help and overcoming those and reflecting on those and adopting mm. like a growth mindset is a, is a good thing. And the third thing that I say is just be kind to yourself. Um, when I say that, I mean, realize that when that imposter feeling comes along, it doesn't mean you're an imposter. Maybe it means that you're growing or you're going against beliefs that, maybe you you didn't choose think about like what would my best friend tell me in this situation and focus on on that so yeah i definitely say talk about it realize that let's quash that fear of failure because you know everybody if we went through vet school and the vet world worried that we'd ever miss something or make a mistake it's going to happen and we're more on our game when we actually say you know what i'm kind to myself and if it does happen, it's not about it happening. It's about what we do with that afterwards. Um, and just knowing that you don't have to know everything. And the final one, as we say, is just talk to yourself like you would a close friend. You know, when you're worrying about something, you know what, you've done your best. Every genuine mistake is a good intention that didn't go according to plan is a quote that I really liked. Um, so they'd be my, my three main ones because they're things that I didn't do. I didn't talk to anyone about it for a long time. I definitely wasn't kind to myself and I didn't embrace any part of me out of the vet world, which mm. comes under being kind to yourself. And I used to think that I was so on form for looking for mistakes that I'd find them in the tiniest of things. And a case that looked like it was brilliant on the outside, I'd be like, yeah, but it wasn't very good because this happened. Nobody knew it happened. The clients didn't see anything happen. Mm -hmm. It was no detriment to the animal. It was no detriment to anybody else. I'd just be like, you forgot to write this in the notes. You need to go back and do it now. You know, so Good. they'd be my three main ones. Thanks for that. And thanks for your time. If people would like to reach out to you, what's the best way to reach out to you to find out more about what you do? Awesome. So the best way would likely be by visiting my website, which is www.katiefordvet.com. Uh, I'm also on Instagram where that's probably my most active social media platform, which is at Katie Ford Vets. And I am also on Facebook as Imposter Busting with Katie Ford. So they're the three places that you can find me online, usually quite prolifically. <laughs> Excellent. I'll make sure it's, it's in the show notes as well. well Thank you so much. Katie. Thank you very, very much for your time. It's been a complete pre uh, pleasure just listening to what you're saying and sharing your experience, really. Thank you very much for that. Oh, thank you so much. It's been lovely to talk to you as well. Thank you for having me on. <laughs>